Hello everybody, this is Dr. Vishal Trivedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati. And uh, in this course, uh, so far uh, we, have, we were discussing about the uh, chromatography and in the beginning we have discussed about the basics of chromatography and then uh, we discuss about the, uh, the protein purification systems and how to operate the protein purification system. And then previous two lectures we have discussed about the ion exchange chromatography followed by the hydrophobic interaction chromatography. Now in today's lecture we are going to discuss about the gel filtration chromatography. So uh, if you recall uh, we have discussed about this that the protein has the multiple properties uh, which can be exploited. So so far we have discussed about the how to discuss how to uh, exploit the charge or the hydrophobicity uh, region present in the protein with the help of the ion exchange chromatography as well as the hydrophobic interaction chromatography. Now today we are going to discuss about the gel filtration chromatography and the gel the basic principle of the gel filtration chromatography is that where the proteins are being separated based on their size and uh, uh, in today's lecture we will discuss how we can actually be able to achieve that. So uh, before uh, getting into the details of the uh, protein uh, gel filtration chromatography, it is important to understand how the protein is being synthesized uh, in the cell and how that synthesized protein get folded and then it adopts the three dimensional conformations. So what you can see is that the protein is being synthesized as the linear chain of peptide, uh, peptide chain where the individual amino acids are coupled with the help of the peptide bond and that is how the, pep, uh, the protein is being synthesized from the ribosome. So as soon as the small stretch of the peptide comes out from the ribosome, it starts uh, folding and these foldings are mostly being governed by the intramolecular interaction between the different side chains. So you know that the protein is made up of, of 20 different types of amino acids and all these 20 different types of amino acids have the different types of side chains. For example, you have the basic amino acids which have the uh, uh, which have the positively charged uh, uh, side groups or you can have the acidic uh, amino acids such as the aspartate and glutamate which are actually having the uh, acid has the acid uh, as the side chain and uh, uh, apart from that you have the polar amino acids or the non-polar amino acid and as well as the hydrophobic amino acid. So all these amino acids are actually contributing different types of interactions. For example, the hydrophobic and hydrophobic amino acids are always being uh, forming a interaction with the help by the pi pi interactions or uh, being stabilized uh, structures by the pi pi interactions whereas the positively charged residues and the negatively charged residues are forming a interaction by the either the hydrogen bonding or van der Waal interactions or the Saal bridges. So all these interactions initially decides or the uh, uh, govern the uh, folding of these uh, proteins and uh, ultimately the protein will going to be properly folded to acquire a three dimensional conformations and in the three dimensional conformation what you are going to see is that the, uh, the uh, hydrophobic residues or the side chains are going to be localized within the center of this protein which is called as the uh, hydrophobic core. So this is called as the core of the protein where you are going to have the hydrophobic amino acids uh, whereas the periphery is going to have the polar amino acids. So this arrangement is uh, happening because you have the water outside and uh, all the polar amino acids love the water. So actually you have the hydrophobic core in the center and the hydrophilic periphery on the uh, on the periphery of the proteins and mostly the proteins are arranging their amino acid ag against a central uh, 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 central axis. So and that, that is true for most of the uh, globular proteins. So if you see a protein from the top what you will see is that it is actually forming a coiled structure like this 
and where the center is uh, being done. So, if you measure the cross sections, what you will see is that the diameter of this uh, globular protein is uh, indirectly or indirectly is going to be uh, proportional to the size or the molecular weight of this particular protein. Uh, so, this is what we are discussing that you have the hydrophobic uh, core and the hydrophilic uh, periphery and this hydrophilic periphery is having the, uh, the uh, water outside. So, uh, as we discussed uh, the uh, amino acids are arranged along uh, axis in the, uh, in the globular proteins. Uh, it is always maintaining a relationship between the diameter of a protein versus the molecular weight. Let us see uh, how it happens. So, as we discussed the protein is arranging all the amino acid along a particular axis. So, as you can see I have shown you the uh, multiple examples. So, what you can see is that I have taken a protein of 5 kilo Dalton and the 5 kilo Dalton means it is going to have the amino acids which are 45 in number and if you calculate the diameter of this protein what you will see is that the diameter of this protein is 2.45 nanometer. Similarly, if I increase the size to the 15 kilo Dalton what you will see is that the number of amino acids will gone up to the 135 and the size is also gone by the 3.53 nanometer. Similarly, what you see is that the this is the uh, small size uh, protein and this is a large size protein and all these sizes are uh, increasing as you are increasing the molecular weight which means for all the globular proteins the size of a protein is uh, directly indirectly related to its molecular weight. You can actually follow this link and be able to calculate the size of a particular protein. If you put the amino acid sequence you could be able to calculate the size of that particular protein. So, now what is the uh, how the gel filtration pro uh, chromatography is work is you can imagine that I, I have the beads of the different sizes and what I am going to do is if I have the beads of the different sizes and if I want to separate them. For example, if you have the, uh, the rice and wheat uh, with you, so rice is a small in size and the wheat is large in size. So, what you are going to do? What you are going to do is you are going to take the, uh, the sieves or the you are going to uh, filter them through the uh, small pores and in that process what will happen is, so if I have a mixture of the rice and the wheat, so what I will do is I will take a molecular sieve or I will take a sieve and I will choose the sieve in such a way that its uh, diameter is going to be good enough for the rice. So, once I will sieve uh, what I will, what will happen is that the wheat will going to be remain on this and the rice will pass through to this pores and that is how the rice is going to be collected into the uh, lower chamber and the wheat is going to be collected on the top chamber. So, that is the way you are going to separate the two molecules which are actually different in the sizes. Similarly, the same principle can be used to, di to distinguish or to uh, purify the different types of proteins. So, as you have seen that we have the proteins of the different sizes starting from the 1.53 nanometer to 20 nanometers. So, what you can do is you can take a sieve and if you start filtering the proteins through that sieve ultimately what will happen is that the larger molecules are going to be remain on top and the smaller molecule will pass through. But in the case of gel filtration, so uh, that is what is going to happen. So, you have the, uh, the sieves of the large pores or the small pores. So, when you pass through the molecules what will happen is that the large molecules are not going to enter into the, these small pores. So, compared to the sieving effect you have the reverse sieving effect where the small molecules because in this case the small is passing through the pores whereas 
the large is retaining onto the uh, sieve whereas in this case when you taking a bead which contains the large pore versus the small pores and when you are passing through the proteins of different sizes the small proteins are entering into these pores whereas the large proteins are being excluded from the pores and that is how you are actually going to separate. So, what will happen is that as soon as that happens the large molecules are going to be uh, comes out from the column first and the small molecules are going to be come later and that will continue because you are not going to have the pores of one particular diameter you can have the pores of the different diameter and that is how you can be able to have that uh, sieving effect to see a separation of the molecule based on the sizes. So, let us uh, understand this in a more uh, elaborated way that the once you have the small pores the pores are good enough to retain the small sizes, but they are not good enough to retain the large sizes. So, what happen is the large sizes are going to be remain into the uh, out into the uh, is, is going to be excluded from these beads. So, that is how the uh, small uh, large sizes are going to come out first and the small sizes are going to be retained in the beads and they will come on the later size. So, this is what you will understand. So, this is the uh, just to explain you the basic principle. So, in the gel filtration what you have is the column is packed with the beads containing the pore allow the entry of the molecule based on their sizes. A smallest size in the pore inner part of the pore followed by the gradual increasing size and the largest molecule excluded from entering into the gel. The separation between the molecule occurs due to the time they travel to come out from the pores. When the mobile phase passes through the column it takes protein along with it. The small molecule present in the inner part of the gel takes longer flow of liquid or tra and travel longer path to come out whereas the larger molecule travel less distance to come out. As a result the large molecules and the small molecule get separated from each other. So, suppose so in the in the gel filtration what you are doing is you are taking a column and you are filling this column with the beads these beads are actually having the pores. So, what will happen is if you are injecting a mixture of the small as well as the big molecules the small molecules are entering into the beads at different positions. For example, in this case you see that the green is uh, being entered into the beads at this position, red is entered into the this position and the orange is actually the big enough. So, it is being excluded or it is actually entering into a latter portion of the column. So, the, in the beginning the molecules are being present on to the top of the column once they travel throughout the column they get distributed as per their molecular sizes and get filled into the different area of the beads. And then once you flow the mobile phase the proteins comes out uh, will travel throughout the mobile phase and that is how the orange will come first, the red will come later on and the green will come toward the end. And that is how uh, all these molecules are going to be separated from each other. So, uh, now to understand this how the separation phenomena works let me show you the typical bead how the beads of a gel filtration chromatography look like. So, in a, in a typical gel filtration chromatography the bead is having a cone shape pores from all the sides something like this ok. So, this is the portion where is the narrowest diameter and this is the largest diameter. So, when you are loading the these kind of beads with the different types of molecules what will happen is the molecules are entering into these beads or these pores and the smallest molecule is entering and sitting at the bottom of the spore. Then the molecule bigger to this is sitting on top of this the molecule bigger to this is sitting on top of this 
and the largest molecule is sitting on top of this whereas the molecule which is bigger to this is being excluded from the column. Now when you loading the samples okay, this does not occur in every bead what is present in the column because there is a competition between the different molecules what is being loaded onto the column. So, when you load the molecules, these molecules are being separated or there is a competition. So, what will happen is see the green is the smallest molecule and the red is the middle size whereas the orange is the largest molecule. So, what happen is because the orange is the largest molecule it has it takes more time to travel throughout the column and as a result all these molecules are competing for entering into the pores. So, what happen is the green is entering into the pore first and capturing the pores or capturing the pores which are present onto the first layer whereas the red which is actually of the middle size is competing well compared to the orange one, but it is not competing well is compared to the green ones. So, what will happen is the green ones are this binding to the different set of layers of the pores, different set of layers in the column, but at a different positions within the pore. And ultimately the orange ones, orange ones are uh, uh, also getting distributed and then they are binding to the different positions within the pore, but not on the, the same beads which means the green ones are binding into the initial few layers or the red ones are binding to the subsequent few uh, layers and the orange ones are binding into this layer. So, as a result what will happen is that uh, running the mobile phase the green, red or orange are getting separated or getting traveled throughout the column. So, what will happen is the green ones are traveling from the first layer and up to this. Okay? So, imagine that if this is a column of 25 ml the green ones is probably traveling somewhere around 20 ml okay? because it is binding into the first layer which is and the red ones which are present in the fourth or third or fourth layer is traveling all the way up to the end and probably uh, traveling like 17 ml. Similarly, and the orange ones which are binding to the third layer or the very lower size is traveling somewhere around 12 ml. So, what will happen is see if you see the chromatogram. So, this is what exactly happens when you are injecting a sample the orange ones which are actually traveling very less because the orange ones are only traveling the 12 ml, the red ones are traveling the 17 ml and the green ones are traveling the 20 ml. So, that is how they are actually going to come at a different time points. So, the large ones which is the orange ones are going to come the first the red ones which are of the middle size are coming at the in the middle of the column and the smallest ones are going to come at the last. And that is how the molecules of the different sizes are going to be separated from each other. So, this is the basic principle of the chromatography. Now, if you would like to exploit and utilize the gel filtration chromatography, you have to understand the different types of parameters which are associated with the gel filtration chromatography. So, when you pack a column, you are actually going to use the gel material and the total amount of the gel what is going to use suppose it is the Vt, then Vt is equivalent to the Vg, Vi and Vo. Okay. So, Vg, what is the Vg? Vg is the volume of the gel matrix which means suppose you have taken the 10 ml of the gel. So, you have the gel, the means the, the beads, what is the beads? So, this is the volume of the beads. Okay. Then Vi is the pore volume which means if you have a bead, okay, the you have the pores, right? So, these are called as the Vi 
and this beats the volume of the total beats is called as the VG and the VO is the void volume which means the portion of the column which is actually not going to be participate into the fractionation which means if you take this column okay there is a some portion of the column which is actually not going to participate into the fractionation because this region is not uh, in uh, not participating into the fractionation which means the region which is pre in, in present in between the bits so that is called as the void volume now the volume of the mobile phase to elute uh, analyte from the column is known as the elution volume or the ve so you have the four parameters vt vg vi vo and ve and if you recall the VT is the total column volume, VG is the volume of the beats or the gel matrix, VI is the inner pore volume and the VO is the void volume and the VE is the elution volume. The elution volume is related to the void volume and the distribution coefficient KD. So, the, this, the relationship is that the KD is equivalent to VE minus VO divided by the VI and you can be able to calculate the KD value. So, if you re still recall we have discussed about the distribution coefficient in the in our first lecture of the chromatography where we have said that the distribution coefficients actually determine how the molecules are going to be distributed between the two phases. So, in this case you have two phases one is the aqueous phase which is actually the outside and the other phase is the pores which are present within the these beads. So, this is the VI. So, that is why the molecules are going to be distributed between the VI and the rest of the volume and that proportion or the ratio of that proportion is only known as the, uh, the distribution coefficient and that is how the value the the distribution coefficient is giving in the term of KD is equal to VE minus VO divided by the VI because this is the volume for the outside volume in which the molecule is present versus this is the total pore volume. So, the concentration of the molecule within this pore versus the concentration of the molecule outside is known as the distribution coefficient and that is very important parameter to characterized or to evaluate any protein or any molecules within the gel filtration chromatography. So, the KD is VE minus VO divided by the VI and the KD is the ratio of the inner volume available for an analyte which means the VI and it is independent to the column geometry or the length because if you increase the column length or if you decrease the column length you are also going to change the VO. So, if you change the VO it is actually also uh, the so the pore volume may not change but the VE minus VO will going to be proportionally going to be changed and that is why the KD is the ratio of the uh, concentration of the analyte of the outer volume versus the inner volume and it is independent of the column geometry or the length. Now, cal once you know the KD values, the molecules are going to be of three different categories depending on the KD values. Okay? Now, you can have the analytes which have the KD value equal to 0, which means the KD is 0. So, if I put the 0 here, what will happen is that the VE minus VO is equivalent to 0. Under what conditions you could think that the VE minus VO could be equivalent to the 0? Okay. So, let me draw the pore. Okay. If the KD is 0, the VE minus VO is equivalent to 0, which means the VE is equivalent to VO, which means the elution volume is equivalent to the void volume which means the molecule is sitting somewhere here it is not entering into the pore which means the molecule is going to be excluded from the column. So, if the KD value is equivalent to 0 
VE minus VO is going to be 0 and in those cases the VE is going to be equivalent to the VO which means the molecule is present into the outer uh, outside to the beads or the it is not present into the pore which means it is going to be excluded from the pore ok. Now imagine that you have an analyte which is the having a KD is equivalent to 1 which means the KD is equivalent to 1. So if I put the value what will happen is the VE minus VO is going to be equivalent to VI. So under what condition? the VE minus VO could be the equivalent to VI which means the VE is equivalent to VI plus VO ok. So under what condition you can have the elution volume which is equivalent to the volume of the pore plus the volume of the wide volume which means the molecule is sitting at the end of the pore which means he has to travel the VI from top to this and then he has to travel outside as well which means he has to travel the, uh, the, uh, the volume which is present within the pore and outside as well. So under what condition? The only condition when the analyte is sitting at the end of the pore and it is going to travel all the way ok. Now you have the third condition where the analyte is having a KD value which is more than 1 which means if the KD value is more than 1 which means that the VE is going to be bigger than the VO plus VI which means the molecule is going to be stuck into the column which means it is going to be adsorbed onto the column and it will not come out from the column even if you flow the volume which is equivalent to the VO plus VI which means the molecule is permanently is binding to into the column and it is not coming out. So that is actually happens when you are doing the ion exchange chromatography or hydrophobic interaction chromatography or affinity chromatography where the VE is not uh, following this kind of uh, equations. but but there the V is very much um, bigger than the, uh, the, uh, the one column volume or two column volumes. It depends on the what kind of gradient you are using in ion exchange chromatography or hydrophobic interaction chromatography. But in the case of gel filtration chromatography, if you are running a column of gel 25 ml, you are going to see the elution of each and every molecule by the end of the 25 ml. If the molecules are not coming out in 25 ml, this means they are falling into the third category where the KD value is more than 1 which means the molecules are now binding to the column and the you need to pro, you do some uh, harsh treatment so that these molecules will come out from the column. So, once if you have the analyte which is where the KD value is more than 1, in this situation the analyte will adsorb onto the column matrix and that is actually is not a desirable situation as far as the gel filtration is concerned. Now once you would like to perform the gel filtration chromatography, you have to uh, decide many parameters. So one of the crucial parameter is how to choose the matrix. So matrix is the choice of the column depends on the range of the molecular weight and the pressure limit of the operating equipment which means you have to consider two parameters. One is the molecular weight, the range in which you are interested to perform the chromatography or gel filtration chromatography and then what kind of pressure limit or what kind of operating um, uh, chromatography system you have in your laboratory. So these are the some of the popular uh, gel matrix are available where you have the Cephadex G10. The fractionation range for this is up to 700 Dalton whereas the G Cephadex G25 which is goes from 1000 to 5000 Daltons. Then you have Cephadex 50 which goes from the 1500 to 30,000 Daltons. So now the question comes what do you know by the fractionation range? So if you see the elution profiles of the different types of proteins from a gel filtration column, what you will see is that you have injected the sample and then it travels 
and then you see a baseline uh, thing and then you see the proteins are being eluted from this column at regular intervals and ultimately this is the end of the column. Okay. And then what you see is that the place where it is called as the void volume. So, if you plot and calculate the KAV of this column versus the log molecular weight. Okay. So, if you take the molecular weight of these proteins okay, and calculate the distribution coefficient versus the log molecular weight, what you will see is that the KV and the log molecular weights are maintaining a linear relationship. So, this is the, uh, the protein and this is the last protein what you are uh, fractionating in this column. Okay. So, the protein which is the first protein and the last protein which means protein which is coming just after the void volume is, is the this one right. So, this is the A protein and this is your D protein. Okay. Now, what you see is that beyond this even if you have something it is not going to be fractionated. It is means it is not going to be separated for a particular column. Whereas, the protein if you have the protein larger than this size is also not going to be separated because then you are reaching very close to the wide volume. So, that is why the region beyond the wide volume or be uh, uh, very close to the wide volume is called as the exclusion limit. So, any protein which is bigger to this is going to be fall within the exclusion limit and that is how it decides at what range you of the protein you can be able to fractionate. So, in this case you can fractionate from A to D which means this is the your fractionation range of this particular column. That does not mean that for example, if you take the Cephadex G100 right the fractionation range is that 4000 to 150000 uh, Dalton which means if you have a protein which between 4 to 150 kda that particular protein is going to be separated by the Cephadex G100. That does not mean that you cannot be able to separate the 1 kda protein using this column. You can be able to separate the 1 kda protein, but you will not be able to separate 1 kda from the 4 kda. So, what is mean by the fractionation range is that is uh, suppose you have the true protein which is of 1 kda and 5 kda, this particular column is going to give you the single peak like A because all these two proteins are within the uh, outside the fractionation range. So, one is also uh, uh, outside the fractionation range. So, what will happen is you are going to see a single peak of 1 and 5. Whereas, if you have two proteins which are of 5 and 10, you can be able to see the two different peaks because these are the two values falling within the fractionation range. So, the what is mean by the fractionation range is that in this particular range the column is going to be efficient enough to separate the molecules efficiently. Whereas, if you go above to that or below to that it will still be able to separate, but the you will not be able to see the two individual peaks which means the resolution of the column is going to be compromised beyond the fractionation range. For example, if you take 250 kilo Dalton protein Okay, 250 kilo Dalton protein is also going to come along with the 150 kilo Dalton protein because you cannot go beyond the wide volume. The, the protein cannot be get eluted before the wide volume. So, everything will come into the within the wide volume. Now, how to perform the gel filtration chromatography? The first and the most important component is the column packings because most of the gel filtration chromatography solely depends how well you are packing the column. So, in a column packing the column is uh, the as I think we discussed in the ion exchange chromatography also that when you are getting the column material either you are getting the pre solen the column material or you are getting the column material as a powder irrespective of the conditions 
the first thing what you have to do is you have to take the column material and wash it properly and then you allow it to equilibrate into the, the buffer in which you are going to perform the gel filtration chromatography and let it be swell for overnight so that the beads are going to take up the water because most of these beads are made up of, of sugar. So, once you put, keep them in a dried powder form, they lose the water and they do not have, so they will not be able to maintain or they will not be able to form the uniform uh, beads. Uh, so, you have to allow them to uh, take up the water so that the, they will swell and they will reach to an equilibrium. Once you they will swell, then you actually what you can do is you can take a cylindrical tube or you can take the column as well. Then you first you clog the column with the help of the uh, cotton uh, uh, cotton, or you can use the glass wool. Then what you have to do is you fill the tube 50 percent with the water okay? and then you start uh, pouring the, the column material which is present in the form of slurry. Okay? So, once you pour the slurry will going to settle here and then starts falling into this and then will start uh, settling down from the bottom and that is how it is actually going to start forming the continuous column like this where you all the beads are going to be arranged. Okay? And this arrangement has to be homogeneous, there should be no breaking or there should be no discontinuity because if there will be a discontinuity, it is actually going to hamper the running of the samples. Now ultimately what will happen is the whole column is going to be filled with these beads and your gel filtration column is going to be ready. Now if you would like to pack the columns you have to take consider multiple parameters for example the flow rate because the flow rate at which the maximally you would like to perform or you would like to run the gel filtration chromatography the basic principle is very simple suppose i want to run this column at 1 ml per minute okay then what i'll do is i will pack this column at 5 ml per minute flow rate okay so, if I connect this column to a peristatic pump or to any uh, pump so that the flow of liquid is there, I will do the packing on 5 ml per minute and then I can be able to operate this column at 1 ml per minute maximally because that is the pressure or the back pressure this column can be able to withstand. Why it is so? It is so because you do not want to disturb the packing. Once the packing is settled or once the material is settled, it is going to form a continuous column or continuous chamber. You do not want to disturb that chamber simply because if you increase or decrease the flow rate, it is actually going to bring the air bubbles or it is actually going to disturb the packing. For example, uh, if I am going to start running this column at 10 ml per minute which is actually recommended to run it at 1 ml per minute. Okay? This means you are actually applying lot of pressure onto this column. Okay? So, what will happen? The column is of 25 ml. Okay? As soon as you apply lot of pressure, this column will turn into 22.5 ml which means the 2.5 ml beads are going to be compressed. Okay? Ultimately, what is going to affect? It is actually going to reduce the fractionation range because earlier you were having the 1000 beads or the 1000 plates within this column and now since you compress this column, you are actually uh, changing the pattern. So, you are actually going to change all the parameters. For example, you are going to change the void volumes, you are going to change all other parameters. So, uh, your relationship between the distribution coefficient versus log molecular rate for the previous column, whatever you have done will not going to hold for this column as well. Apart from that, you also have to consider what kind of back pressure you are interested because if you are running a uh, low pressure or the middle pressure column or if you are using a 
low pressure or the middle pressure chromatography systems, you cannot pack the column at a very, very high flow rate. Otherwise, that particular column will not be able to used by the your chromatography system. So, that is also one of the another parameter you have to consider. Okay. So, with this uh, we would like to conclude our lecture here and uh, in the subsequent lecture we are going to take you to my lab for showing you a demo how to pack the gel filtration column and what are the different precautions you have to take when you are doing the uh, packing and as well as how, what are the uh, things you have to consider uh, so that you will be able to utilize the gel filtration chromatography in your laboratory very successfully to complete your experiments. Thank you. Mm -hmm.